and you're live. Thanks, Rob. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Seminary Ridge Museum and Education Center's Tuesday Facebook Live, broadcasting here from Seminary Ridge Museum and Education Center. My name is Pete Mealy. I work here at the museum as executive director. We took a few weeks off after the anniversary of the Battle of Gettysburg, but we are back bringing you stories in the areas of race, religion, medicine, and war. And we've got a very interesting story to tell this afternoon uh, about Lieutenant Colonel George McFarland, who makes up a very big part of the story, the, the larger story that we tell here at, at the museum. And we're gonna get into that uh, pretty in depth. As we are waiting for people to come online, I'll talk a little bit about what we have coming up. Uh, the museum is open. Uh, Tuesday, uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturdays, Sundays, and Mondays from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. We have uh, CDC recommend, recommended safety guards in place. We ask that you wear a mask when you come in uh, and stay socially distant, but we're uh, cleaning the museum very frequently. Uh, so we invite you to come in if you're in the Gettysburg area and see what we have to offer. Next Tuesday, Dr. Darrell Black, our president, will be talking about African-American religion in the period between the end of the American Revolution and the Civil War. Uh, if you are a member of Seminary Ridge Museum and Education Center on Friday, coming up the 24th at 5 p.m., we have our monthly Zoom history happy hour. Darrell and I will be talking about nurses and volunteer uh, attendance, both here at the, uh, the museum who served here in this building, but then in the larger Civil War picture. So if you are a member, that is a, a great uh, and very fun event that we've added on uh, in the last couple of months. All of this will be, is, is uh, available on our website. Rob, who is in the control room next door, will be putting the links in the, uh, in the comments here. Uh, if you like what you see here from Seminary Ridge, uh, joining and supporting uh, our, our efforts here is a great way uh, to, to become our partner. Uh, we also ask you to like and to share this, this video with your friends. Let them know the fun stuff that you are doing and seeing and what you are learning uh, during these times of, of COVID and quarantine. What we're going to do today, I, I really want to focus on this generally overlooked figure in Lieutenant Colonel George McFarland. He's not an army commander, not a brigade division uh, commander, uh, and he did not make any heroic charges here at Gettysburg. In fact, his involvement in the actual fighting at Gettysburg is doesn't take a lot of time, uh, but he is part of a very heroic defense, the last stand uh, of the, uh, the Union First Corps here on the west end of town, in fact, right on the seminary campus. And he's only a soldier for a, for a short time. Uh, about nine months uh, is his term of service. But like so many others, the, the remainder of his life, and he lives for 28 years after the, the Civil War, uh, after the Battle of Gettysburg, the remainder of his life is defined by his experience in the army and especially here at Gettysburg. And he suffers a wound and he's reminded every day for his remaining 28 years about, about his service and about what happened here on Seminary Ridge west of Gettysburg. And it really shows that cost of war, the true cost of war, men who were going home with their bodies broken, in some cases their, their minds uh, affected by what they saw during battle. For us, George McFarland is a very prolific diarist and, and during his time in war, but then also a very prolific writer after the war and active in veterans affairs. So he leaves this great paper trail uh, showing what he, uh, what he felt during the battle, talking about his emotions, and then of course in the years following the battle, what he did as a member of veterans organizations and what he, um, what he felt and what he experienced being uh, going home with his right leg amputated below the knee and his left ankle shattered. Nobody has done more work to bring George McFarland and the 151st Pennsylvania Volunteers into the public eye than uh, Mike Dries, who is a friend of the museum um, and has written the, the book on the 151st Pennsylvania and also edited 
portions of McFarland's diary. So a lot of times we say that historians stand on the shoulders of others, and I, I am standing on Mike Dries' shoulders right now as we present this, this program today. So a great, a big shout out and a great thank you to Mike Dries for all the fantastic work that he has done on the 151st on McFarland and, and on this, this building, this seminary hospital uh, on, the, uh, on the first day of the Battle of Gettysburg and beyond. So who is George McFarland? We can see him right there behind us. Uh, his wife, Addie, children, Horace and Emma, they come here after the, the, uh, the Battle of Gettysburg and help nurse McFarland. But he, he's 28 years old, he, 29 years old here at the time of the Battle of Gettysburg. And uh, he's best known for being a teacher, uh, principal of the McAllisterville Academy in Juniata County. He had started uh, teaching at age 16. His father had been a canalman on the, on the Susquehanna Canal. George had, uh, had taken some time piloting boats on the canal. And at age 16, he starts going into education. And education is something that he's going to value very, very heavily uh, throughout his entire life. And we'll talk a little bit about that, both his own education, but then the, the education of, of others. Um, he's a community leader in, in McAllisterville, in his small village of McAllisterville. Uh, He's the, the, the school principal there, owns the McAllisterville uh, Academy, as I, as I said earlier. Um, and he's, he's a very driven man. Uh, you look at his writings, you look at uh, his actions, and you get this, this image of a, of a very, uh, very self-interested uh, in, in self-improvement and, uh, and, and bettering himself. Uh, he, he wants to be a good soldier. He takes to soldiering. Uh, and to learning and how to be a good soldier, but then also teaching it to the other men in his regiment. And, and even looking before he gets into the, into the war and looking at sort of the, the, the schedule of, of lessons that he prepares for himself to, to, to better himself, he takes, undertakes uh, rigorous Bible examinations and Bible readings. Uh, lessons, teaches himself philosophy, psychology, science, uh, wants to learn new subjects. And he writes this out in his diary, his, his, his serve, his, um, uh, what he wants to do that year, uh, starting in 1862. He says, I want to, I want to read these Bible verses. I want to read these books. I want to learn these subjects. So you, you get the, Im the image of this very driven uh, man and that's going to, of course, translate into him becoming a, a, a soldier. So McFarland spends the first two years or year and a half sitting on the sidelines, um, watching the war from afar. And it's not until uh, September of 1862, after the second battle uh, of Bull Run at the end of August, that coupled with Abraham Lincoln's call for 300,000 more volunteers to put down the rebellion. That's when McFarland makes what is very likely the most difficult and important decision of his life. And that is, and he writes it in his diary, at last I have determined to go to war if a good company can be raised. And McFarland, the community leader that he is, goes about trying to recruit this company of men. Uh, and he's very successful in recruiting uh, in, in recruiting about 40 men, they go to Harrisburg. Uh, McFarland uh, is elected the leader, the elected the, the captain of Company D. Uh, men that are going to make up the, uh, are going to be mustered in to the 151st Pennsylvania Volunteers. And surprisingly to him, McFarland is elected the lieutenant colonel of the 151st Pennsylvania when they uh, are mustered and, and the companies are brought into a, a regiment of a thousand men at Harrisburg. McFarland is elected the Lieutenant Colonel, the second in command of the regiment. And due to his, uh, the Colonel Harrison Allen being uh, out, out on sick leave during the Gettysburg campaign, McFarland himself is going to be leading this regiment when they come here to Seminary Ridge on the first day of July, uh, 1863. The 151st Pennsylvania is, a, is an interesting regiment to think about. And at Seminary Ridge Museum, we think a lot about sort of the individual regiments and what it says about 
feelings about war and communities at war. And there's a fantastic uh, quote in a, in, in a, a book about um, soldiers from the mountains of Pennsylvania, which talks about there being many Norths, that the North, the Union, the United States was not one solid block of, of people against the South, that there are many different motivations for going to war. There are many different feelings about union, about democracy, about abolitionism, about anti-slavery. And the men of the 151st tend to be fighting uh, more motivated by, uh, by a desire to maintain the union than necessarily uh, fighting against the institution of slavery. And there's a great quote some of the men even talk about what they, what they, why they went to war. And there's a, there's a great quote by a man named Peter Haywood, who's in Company C of the 151st. And in October, uh, February of 1863, he writes, from personal intercourse and conversation with most every man in our company, I am satisfied there is not one left whom you can induce to say that they are supporters of abolitionism or one who voluntarily will raise a gun for the purpose of carrying out the hellish program of the radical Republicans. And that feeling not only exists in Company C, but in the whole regiment. So that he's saying that everybody is not, uh, everybody is against abolitionism. Well, that's not necessarily, uh, not, not necessarily true because other people um, say that uh, that, that I am fighting against the institution of slavery. So you can see these different feelings bubbling up in the 151st. Many of the men who make up the 151st come from the, the Pennsylvania Dutch region or of Pennsylvania Dutch stock from Berks County, uh, just about a hundred miles northeast of here. And um, these men uh, who had been here in America for, for hundreds of years, so that first wave of German immigrants who come over between the 16 and, and uh, mid 1700s had sort of formed themselves into these insular communities and want to sort of do their own thing and not be influenced by the government in Washington or the Republicans. Uh, so they see the war for, uh, for, for maintaining the union and maintaining democracy more than some of these movements like abolitionism and temperance and, uh, and, and things like that. So very conservative uh, or regimen fighting for preservation of the union, preservation of democracy uh, and, and not so much abolition. And McFarland himself writes about this in his diary uh, well, I, no, I'm sorry, at the, at the, at the uh, dedication of the monument that we'll get to in a, in, a, in a few minutes, he says that we were engaged in this severe and deadly battle for the preservation of the un national union and the blessings it secured. So he says really clearly what he is fighting for. So the 151st Pennsylvania is going to be a nine month regiment. Uh, they're going to be mustered in in October. Uh, of 1863, they're going to start uh, performing guard duty at Union Mills, uh, Virginia. McFarland, during this time, as as the lieutenant colonel, is reading every book that he can get his hands on about soldiering. And in February of 1863, the men of the 151st received their Enfield rifles, uh, and they had had been been. Uh, issued smoothbore muskets before that. Now with their new Enfield rifles, they recognize that it's di more difficult to aim. McFarland writes that the men who could hit the eye out of a squirrel at a hundred yards with a smoothbore could not fire an Enfield because with be it being a rifled musket, the bullet arcs up uh, after the first hundred yards and will go over the heads of the men you are firing at if you don't uh, aim correctly. And McFarland recognizes this and instructs his men to take target practice, to spend time to learn how to accurately and appropriately aim these weapons so they'll be more effective in battle. We'll talk about that in a second. But it, again, it gets at that McFarland is really valuing education. He's valuing uh, teaching his men. He's taking his own uh, attitudes towards self-improvement and bringing it to the men that he is leading. 
Uh, so, so very uh, interesting. The, the, uh, the, the 151st joins the United States Army of the Potomac in February of 1863 at Fredericksburg. They're attached to the first corps uh, and that's where they're gonna, that's where they're gonna uh, spend the, the remainder of their service. They're lightly involved in the Battle of Chancellorsville, but not that, not that much. They do see their first casualties there at, at Chancellorsville, um, but their real test is going to be the Gettysburg campaign. So uh, they, they begin to march uh, with the rest of the army as they're pulling away from the Fredericksburg area, sort of shadowing the, 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 the Confederate army that's marching uh, up the Shenandoah Valley into Pennsylvania. And uh, it, it's a really grueling march that the, the, the Union Army and the First Corps takes. And, and McFarland is, is writing about it the entire time that they are, that they are uh, on this march. And um, you know, they, they leave the Fredericksburg area on June 12th. And he writes in his diary how many miles they march each day. And in six days, by June 18th, he calculates that they've marched 100 miles uh, on, on what almost amounts to a, a, a forced march. On June 18th, he also writes that it's the hottest day of the season and there is no air. And if you're in Gettysburg or the, the South Central Pennsylvania region right now, you probably have an idea of what McFarland uh, is, is talking about it with whether it's been in the 90s and, and up to 100 in this area uh, for the last couple of days. So um, we always have to remember that these men undertake these grueling marches in, in oppressive heat. Um, and, and how does that affect, what does that do? What is the weather, what is the environment doing to these men who are undertaking these, uh, these marches? They cross the Potomac River with the rest of the First Corps on June, on, uh, June 25th, 1863, and are gonna march almost every day uh, until, uh, until July 1st. So they're gonna have six days of marching even before uh, they get into the battle. They had stopped for a little while around Leesburg on, uh, um, uh, and they're, they're stationary in Leesburg for a little time. So they didn't march continuously from June 12th to July 1st, had a, had a, had a little break in there, but uh, the six days previous to the battle is, is all marching and, uh, and far uh, at that. And uh, there's, a, there's a really great small collection of letters that, that uh, was brought to my attention a few years ago from another soldier in the 151st, a man named uh, Jonathan Himmelberger, who is a, uh, a, a mill worker from Berks County, Pennsylvania. And on June 21st, he, while they're in camp in Leesburg, he writes a letter to his brother. Um, and he says to his brother, I, I, am, uh, I am done with soldiering. Uh, <clears throat> I don't care if I seen, see more fighting, I have seen plenty enough for once. Uh, and Himmelberger's attitude has changed because before this, he had talked about joining up again when his term of service is over, but once he gets through the Battle of Chancellorsville, and once he's on this really grueling march to Pennsylvania, he starts to say to his brother, I am done. I am done being a soldier. And he says to his brother, I expect to be home by August, if not sooner, maybe as early as the 4th of July. The 151st and the rest of the First Corps Cross, as I said, the, the Potomac River on July, June 25th and begin marching through Barnesville and Poolsville in Maryland up to uh, Middletown and Frederick before coming up to Gettysburg. McFarland writes in his diary, the moment we landed on the Maryland shore all seemed different. People were well clad and seemed cheerful and sympathizing. Every family along the route was busy baking bread and cakes for the soldiers and selling eatables everything else in a manner, be, uh, in the like manner betoken civilization, industry, thrift, and prosperity. He even passes a school in, uh, in Poolsville, Maryland, and talks about how great it is to see a school and these kids come out, these young girls come out and wish him well as they're, as they're passing by. First time he had seen a schoolhouse uh, in, in months. <clears throat> so, June 30th, the night of June 30th to July 1st is going to be the first night that
that the men of the 151st are gonna spend on Pennsylvania soil in seven months. And we have to think a little bit about what John Reynolds, the commander of the first corps is, is feeling, what intelligence he's getting back from John Buford, who's already up here at Gettysburg uh, on that evening and how it's, it's affecting the disposition of, of Reynolds' force. Reynolds' headquarters are at Moritz Tavern, which is uh, about five miles, six miles south of the town of Gettysburg. We did a video on it uh, for our uh, leading up to the, to the, um, the anniversary or Beyond the Ridge series. And he fans out his three divisions along about a six mile arc. And what Reynolds is concerned about is that his left flank will be turned uh, from the direction of Fairfield. He believes based on some reconnaissance that Buford had brought to him that there is a large contingent of Confederates between Fairfield, Pennsylvania and Cashtown, Pennsylvania. And in fact, that Cashtown was where uh, Harry Heath's division was. And in order to compensate or, or, or to address this supposed threat, Reynolds pushes the entire third division of the first corps out to the west at the, at the intersection of, uh, of what's today uh, Bullfrog Road and Pumping Station Road, an area called White's Crossroads. And by pushing the third division out in that direction, they're gonna be able to keep an eye on a threat from Fairfield and, and be the first line of defense if anything uh, is to occur. So that's where the 151st is gonna spend the night before the battle. There's, it, it mists the night before the battle. So these men wake up, they're wet. They start to march uh, towards uh, Gettysburg. They're gonna uh, march on Millerstown Road, again today, Pumping Station Road. Uh, and people are gonna come out from their houses along this road and give more food and drink to the soldiers that are passing. And in fact, uh, there, there are two really great accounts and it, it shows how some of the people in this area were really excited, really happy that the, the Union Army had come back to, had come to Pennsylvania and had come to defend them. Uh, this area throughout the, the entire war had lived under constant threat that the Confederates were gonna raid into Pennsylvania and now the threat was getting more real, but their defenders were coming to save them. And uh, one soldier in the 80th New York, which was brigaded with the 151st said, the women brought to the roadside immense loaves of homemade bread baked after the fashion of the country in pans as large as milk pans and with crocks of sweet, fresh butter. As for the troops who passed in their rapid march, they offered these dainties, for dainties they were to the men who had almost forgotten the taste of good bread and butter, to, to the men who one after another stopped long enough to receive the treat. George McFarland himself, riding at the head of his men, uh, is offered some, uh, some, some sustenance from a, a young girl. When the troops were rushed from Frederick to Gettysburg, and this is a letter from the niece of the girl writing years later to George McFarland's son Horace writes about, uh, about George passing by. When the Union troops were rushed from Frederick to Gettysburg that hot July day as part of them passed my grandfather's farm, Aunt Emily had filled two brimming buckets with milk and carried it out to the head of the lawn to refresh as many men as she could. Young McFarland, and this is George, age 29, had gotten a cup of that milk. So the men of the 151st and, and, and uh, Biddle's Brigade of the 3rd Division are going to march over Sachs Bridge, the covered bridge that's still there today. Uh, they are going to march up Black Horse Tavern Road and turn off on what today is Willoughby Run Road, which sort of follows the path of Willoughby Run until it hits uh, Fairfield Road or Hagerstown Road, Route 116 out of Gettysburg. And there, the, they're going to go into line of battle and move forward and actually run into the flank of James Archer's brigade. And after a little bit of firing, the 3rd Division pulls back and moves along the Fairfield Road out here to McPherson Ridge and goes into, continues, stays in line of battle facing 
West. They don't arrive on the battlefield here at Gettysburg until that initial fighting had taken place where the Iron Brigade and Cutler's Brigade slam into Archer's and Davis's Brigade and push them back that initial fighting that's going to take place between about 9 and 10.30 in the morning, the fighting that's going to see the death of John Reynolds. Uh, so the, the, the third division is going to uh, get here during what's commonly called the lull in the fighting. And Biddle's brigade is going to be in a very precarious position. And they're going to start by on McPherson Ridge facing to the west. And as the day goes on and Robert Rhodes' division appears on Oak Hill just to the north, shells are going to start falling on Biddle's brigade. And Biddle's brigade is going to turn to face to the north to counter this threat. And then they're going to turn back and face to the east to counter the increased infantry threat there. So twice they, tw they have to change position uh, before the fighting even begins, the afternoon fighting here west of town even begins. Before the fighting is resumed at about three o'clock in the afternoon, McFarland's men are detached from the rest of their brigade and pulled back here to the back door of the seminary to a barricade of rails that had been built earlier in the day and they are going to form the final, the last reserve force that Abner Doubleday, now commander of the First Corps, is going to have at his disposal. This one regiment of 467 men is going to be the only force that Doubleday has if things go bad. And that's what's going to happen. Things are going to, are going to turn bad. So at about three o'clock in the afternoon, Harry Heath is going to resume his attack here west of Gettysburg. He's going to use Pettigrew's large North Carolina Brigade to force the Iron Brigade out of Herbst Woods, to force Biddle Brigade, Biddle's Brigade off of McPherson Ridge. And as Abner Doubleday is watching this, he recognizes that it is time to send in the 151st Pennsylvania Volunteers. And they, they go across, they jump over the barricade of rails here on the seminary grounds, and uh, they're going to, uh, to march out towards uh, the southeastern corner of McPherson Ridge today. It's right about where Stone Meredith Avenue is going to come in and intersect with Reynolds Avenue. It's right where the 151st monument is uh, today. McFarland this is where the self-control, the self-improvement is really going to pay off for McFarland's men, all of the education that he instilled in them uh, during their, their time uh, on picket duty and guard duty down in, in Virginia. I did not order them to fire a regular volley, McFarland remembered, but each man was to fire as he saw an enemy on which to take steady aim. This was strictly observed and during the next hour's fighting, many of the enemy were brought low. So all of that target practice that McFarland had had his men take uh, when they got their Enfield rifles was going to come in, in handy. McFarland admitted years later at the dedication of the monument, in, all of our, in, in, in battle, all of our senses are quickened. And moments seem to contain more, many times, 60 seconds. It is therefore hard to estimate time. He says it's an hour that they're out there. Quite possibly it was only somewhere around 15 or 20 minutes. Uh, McFarland begins to look to either side and he sees Biddle's brigade pulling back to his left. He sees the Iron Brigade, the 19th Indiana, pulling back to his right. And McFarland recognizes that it is time to start to pull his men back uh, as well. He says, I do not know how men could have fought more desperately, exhibited more coolness, or contested the field with more determined courage than did those of the 151st Pennsylvania Volunteers on that ever memorable day. And they're gonna pull back the retreat from McPherson Ridge behind the barricade of rails by all accounts is very orderly. It's not a pell-mell running back across 600 yards all of the regiments that come off the ridge are coming, are pulling back, wheeling into line, turning, firing, retreating, wheeling, turning into uh, firing, retreating. 
Uh, so they're able to stop uh, Pettigrew's men at the crest of McPherson Ridge and give some time uh, to, to form this, this barricade of rails line. McFarland's 151st Pennsylvania is gonna take the center of that barricade of rails line. Uh, the barricade is going to form a kind of a crescent shape uh, heading out towards, uh, and, the, and the bulge of it is going to be out uh, right behind the seminary uh, back door. Uh, and McFarland and the men of the 151st are gonna watch as two fresh Confederate brigades under Abner Perrin and Alfred Scales, Perrin's men, secessionists from, North, from South Carolina, Scales men, mountain men from North Carolina are going to come across that open field in an attempt to dislodge this barricade of rails line. Behind McFarland, behind the line, 21 guns of Charles Wainwright's artillery, First Corps artillery. And the minute that the Southerners crest the ridge on, Mc, on McPherson Ridge and begin their descent down into the swale and across the open field, those cannon are gonna open up. And Scales Brigade is gonna get the worst of it. They are going to be torn to pieces, get to the middle of the field and go to ground. Perrin's men are going to start to falter about halfway across the field. By this time, small arms fire has started. The men of the 151st, the rest of Biddle's brigade are now peppering them with, uh, with small infantry fire. Perrin rides out on his horse. He gets his men started again. And as he is looking to the south end of the seminary campus, he notices that there is a gap in the line between where the barricade line ends and where Buford's cavalry have taken their position on the Fairfield Road. Perrin orders two of his regiments, the 12th and 13th South Carolina, through that gap. He orders the 1st South Carolina at an oblique and they're gonna turn around and they're gonna wheel into line and fire down the flank of the First Corps barricade line. Uh, and all of this is done and, uh, and it dislodges the First Corps line there on Seminary Ridge. Um, <clears throat> McFarland and his men recognize that it's going to be time to retreat he gets his men up, he gets his men moving, and they're gonna uh, pass the, what's today, the north end of the seminary building between the seminary and the chapel. And McFarland is going to be behind his men as, as he is doing this. And he stops about 20 paces off the northwest corner of the seminary building, and he stops and he, he bends down. He talks about the smoke, it's, it's all very smoky in this area, the artillery fire, the small arms fire. So he can't see anything and he crouches down and he looks at what's behind him. And as that occurs, the men of the first South Carolina fire a volley and McFarland is hit in both legs. He says later that it was one bullet that went through both legs or two bullets that hit simultaneously. And McFarland is gonna crumple to the ground. And some of his men are gonna try to stop and to, and to help him. And he says, no, keep going. Uh, one soldier, one private, Lyman Wilson, doesn't obey his commander and picks McFarland up and drags McFarland into the, the north end of the seminary building. And as he says, he writes later, as, as I was brought in the north door, the Confederates were coming in the south door. And McFarland and all of the rest of the men who had uh, been brought in this building during the first day of the battle as it's a hospital are going to be prisoners. And McFarland is going to talk about, uh, write prolifically about his, his wounding and especially the first days of, of his wounding. Uh, he writes in his diary, as soon as the rebels took possession of the hospital, they were seized and carried off all of the instruments, chloroform, etc. And for three days, we were left without food, drink, or attendance. And he's going to be lying in a pool of his own blood on the bare floor. Uh, at at um, July 2nd or July 3rd, he gets a bed as Robert Cummins of the 142nd Pennsylvania is, uh, dies and is buried out in the yard. McFarland is going to be put in a bed somewhere on the southeast end of the building. 
And right outside the southeast corner of the building is a battery of Confederate artillery firing towards Cemetery Hill. Well, of course, the Union Army is firing back here at this battery. And McFarland is lying in bed as a cannonball comes through the window. And if he had been sitting up, he would have been killed. Uh, so he watches a, a, a cannonball go right over uh, his head. On July 5th, the battle over, the Confederates are going to retreat. The Union Army is going to retake the hospital, is going to begin treating patients here, is going to be uh, begin moving patients out of here, but McFarland is going to stay for, for a very long time. In fact, he is going to end up being the patient, excuse me, who stays in this building the longest. His right leg is amputated just below the knee. His left ankle, they're able to not amputate it, but it's, it's shattered. Uh, his wife, a letter is sent to his, his wife, uh, who comes and helps to nurse McFarland uh, during his time here. Uh, he writes a lot about the pain that he experiences, and, and some of this is, is really uh, vivid. Uh, August 20th, my pain was so great that I did not sleep a particle. I never had greater. But not to be deterred from this pain and from losing his right leg, he goes back to thinking about education, thinking about self-improvement and betterment. In this building, he starts preparing circulars for a history of the third division of the first corps. He sends them out. He's trying to accumulate stories so he can write this, this book. He is meeting with people like Samuel Simon Schmucker, who's the president of the seminary. Uh, if he stays any longer, he wants Schmucker to start teaching him theology. Uh, so again, we, we keep coming back to this highly valued education and this idea that, uh, that he's never done uh, learning. Well, on September 16th, McFarland is finally well enough to leave this building. Uh, he's going to leave. He's going to go back to McAllisterville to Juniata County. Uh, he is going to be in severe pain. He's going to be in bed for 42 weeks, and he writes a, a diary entry where he talks about the first day that he stands up, that he, he gets out of bed for the first time, and he hobbles around the room on crutches, and he has a, 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 an artificial leg, and he talks about it like it is the, the, the best thing that after being in 40, after being in bed for 42 weeks, even this poor stagger around the room was a great relief. But his wounds are never going to fully heal. For the rest of his life, his, both of his wounds are going to be expelling bits of pus, expelling bits of bone. Uh, so that's, again, that constant reminder that uh, of, of what, he, what happened here at the Battle of Gettysburg. Uh, He's going to go back to teaching at McAllisterville Academy. He's going to turn the, uh, that school into uh, a, a school for orphans of, uh, of soldiers. Uh, and eventually, he is going to become the state superintendent of the orphan school system, uh, ministering to students who had lost their father in, in, the, in the war effort. Uh, so he, he tries, again, we get back to this you can see the common theme here, the high value of education that, that McFarland has. He's also going to be very active in memory of the battle. Uh, he befriends John Batchelder, who is the first historian of Gettysburg. He's going to help Batchelder recreate and, and, and uh, write the history of the battlefield. He's going to come back here in 1866. Uh, he's going to, that's the first time he's going to return to the battlefield. He's going to look at the line, the, the barricade of rails line, and then he's going to be carried up to the cupola of this building and observe the battlefield. In 1882, he's going to come back here again, and he's going to meet with Colonel Joseph Newton Brown, who was the commander of the 14th South Carolina, which was the, uh, one of the regiments that opposed McFarland's men on that day. He's also going to meet at that. I think this is really, really fascinating. So when he comes back in, in 1882, he goes to try to find the farm of 
the, the, the young girl who gave him the milk uh, on, as they were marching here. And Frances Cunningham, who's the niece of Emily, who gives, Emily gives George the milk says, I think Colonel McFarland was our guest for two day, or three days. And he and father drove about the battlefield. After he went home, he sent mother a small rooted holly tree. We had never seen holly and mother cherished the little tree for many years. So that's just a little kind of human interest uh, uh, McFarland story. Uh, he's also gonna be very instrumental in uh, raising money and uh, putting the monument out on uh, McPherson Ridge. And he is going to be uh, the keynote speaker there when the monument is dedicated on July 1st, 1888. Um, and that's going to be one of his last acts. Uh, after the monument dedication, he starts to fall ill. His health declines rapidly, uh, a lot still suffering very greatly from these wounds that he has uh, had suffered. And uh, he moves down to Georgia, hopefully that the climate and the environment down in Georgia will be better for his health. Uh, and that's where he's going to die in, uh, on December 18th, 1891 at age 57. Uh, his body is going to be brought back here to, to, uh, to Pennsylvania. And he's buried today in Harrisburg Cemetery. Uh, and as, as I said earlier, he is, he is a, a crucial and instrumental part of the story that we tell here at Seminary Ridge Museum and Education Center, thinking about those costs of war, thinking about this school teacher who determined that it was time to go to war and raised a company, became uh, his elected lieutenant colonel, led this group here, and was going to go, get to go home at the end of July. He only had about three weeks of service left. Uh, when he arrives here on seminary on McPherson Ridge and Seminary Ridge on July 1st. And he's going to be in this building for two and a half months and then go home with these wounds that are going to plague him for the rest of his life. So it gives us something to ponder and something to consider uh, about those those human costs of war uh, that that are and those questions are still with us today. So uh, Rob, do we have any any questions? I'm not seeing any at this time. Okay. But a lot of great, great supportive comments. Okay, well, thank you to, to everybody here who, uh, who joins us. We appreciate your support here. Uh, this has been our Thursday face, uh, Tuesday, gosh, it's Tuesday. I'm, it's gonna be later in the week already. Uh, this has been our, our Tuesday Facebook Live. Join us again next uh, Tuesday at 2 p.m. as Dr. Darrell Black talks about African-American religion from the revolution through the Civil War. I invite you to like this video, to share it with your friends, to see this awesome content uh, that we can provide. And then uh, if you really like us, you, we ask you, you can join and support Seminary Ridge Museum, become a member, become a partner. We thank you for all of your support during this difficult time and we hope to see you up on the ridge soon.